Thank you. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Ambassador Jain Prasad for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come back to IDSA, having spent a uh, decade uh, in the IDSA library, both uh, before PhD and after PhD. So it's uh, a great pleasure to be part of the, the exercises uh, that take place here. Uh, and I think uh, my task has become easier with uh, Hush uh, talking about uh, uh, the, the, trans the transformed India-US relationship and why uh, dealing with that is, has become the most important one in India's relationship with the great powers. My focus is more narrowly on uh, India-US uh, engagement in relation to the subcontinent. But before I get there, I think I just wanted to uh, say a couple of uh, preliminary remarks. And I think uh, one is on the, uh, this, this importance of uh, thinking about India's engagement with the world through the prism of great power relations. Because I think uh, it is, uh, it's not actually, uh, it's not been common to, to think of India's relations uh, because you open any textbook, it's always about non-alignment, it's always about uh, India's moral politic, you, what Nehru said in the UN, all the other stuff. Uh, but I think uh, that's only always been a very partial picture. Uh, is my view that actually even non-alignment uh, was really about how do you navigate the relationship between major powers. But yet in the public discourse, it became uh, wrapped in mysticism of a kind that talked about India's moral politic, it had everything included uh, except the discussion of the world in terms of power. Uh, because I think for the Indian national movement, uh, through the interwar period when it began to gain an international consciousness, uh, dealing with the rapidly shifting power distribution in the international system was the most important element. I, mean, I think if you go back to the interwar period, uh, how did India, Indian nationalists think about uh, the unfolding tensions between the rise of Japan, the conflict between Japan and China, uh, which side should India take, where, where, where should India be when finally when the world war uh, happened. I think within that, uh, the nation was deeply divided. Uh, some wanted to align with, uh, with, the, with the West, somebody wanted to align with the Japanese, uh, somebody wanted to say, look, we'll stay apart. So in a sense, actually, the idea that we won't go with anyone, uh, you can see the roots of it in the interwar period, uh, and I don't want to get too much into that, so, but I think today, at a time when there is a historic shift in the great power relations at the, at the international level, and the rise of India itself, I think it's important to restore a measure of uh, power, the question of thinking about the world in terms of power, rather than the kind of uh, moralism, north-south, east-west, and the, those kind of things that we tended to, our discourse uh, tended to be. But the policy implementation was always sensitive to real, real politic, and I think but it is the problem of the lag between uh, the, the discourse and actually what the practitioners do, uh, and I think that has been the uh, problem. But that problem was a lot less when it came to South Asia. Because here, this was your neighborhood, uh, Nehru was one man in the UN, he was another man in the subcontinent. Uh, the first three treaties that Nehru signed were with Sikkim, Bhutan and Nepal, all reheated versions of what the British Raj had with our northern neighbors. Those were not treaties of equality, goodwill, brotherhood, all the stuff that we think India was for, but actually about India sustaining a protective role to the northern neighbors. And it was happening at a time when China was rising. So if there was, you needed Nehru to say, look, here is real politics, there it was. And I think the problem in, in South Asia too was really uh, that it is not non-alignment, it is not about global politics, it's not about the nature of the Cold War that fundamentally put India and US apart in the Cold War. It was essentially about the American policy towards South Asia. That the two could not relate to each other. India sought, it thought it had primacy in the subcontinent, it wanted primacy, and the American, thanks to the British, was deeply aligned with Pakistan. So therefore, the, the, the core problem between India and the United States lay in the, how the two related to each other within India's uh, immediate neighborhood. And I think understanding that uh, is, the, is the most important. Here again, uh, there is life before India became independent. Uh, I think uh, partition, the run-up to partition, uh, the Congress party's refusal to support the war effort in the Second World War, and the Muslim League's support for the war effort. Uh, in a sense, roll the dice, uh, which continues after partition, where Pakistan becomes willing to support the Western objectives uh, in the neighborhood, India does not. So that, that tension between the uh, Indian interests in the skeptical, 
But if, if you look at the last 70 years of India-US relationship in relation to South Asia, we moved from being estranged democracies to engaged democracies to dehyphenation. The question is, what's the next stage? What is the next stage beyond dehyphenation? The dehyphenation has largely took root. We had uh, Bush talk about it. Obama thought about it again. Maybe they'll go back to linking India-Pakistan, but we've seen it eventually stick to a dehyphenation policy. So the next stage, I believe, is, a stat is, a, is one of the possibility of India first in American thinking about South Asia. What is it that's going to make that possible? I would just mention three factors that could facilitate uh, a India first strategy uh, from the United States in the region. I think the first is, uh, is the prospect of American retrenchment and rearrangement of the nature of its relationships in the Eurasian landmass. Uh, Professor Gava used the term recession. Somebody might like to say retreat. Uh, somebody might say, you know, uh, you know, you can use any word, but the essential is that I think the rise of China, the redistribution of power, uh, and Mr. Trump's campaign in the last six months has shown us that the present, where the U.S. takes the leadership, runs everything in the Eurasian landmass, from Europe to the Middle East to South Asia to the Far East, that whether you can sustain this process. But I believe the costs of uh, the, nature of the American foreign policy is a point that's being raised both on the left and the right within the United States, and that there are new ideas being discussed in the U.S. today, uh, which could, you could talk about offshore balancing, uh, you could talk about spheres of influence. In fact, Obama's interview to the Atlantic Monthly where he says, look, uh, can you really fight the Russians in Ukraine and win in Ukraine? So, so I think the idea that, look, you might have to cede some responsibilities to other powers so that you retain your larger role uh, in the international system. And I think that is the big question. My sense is, if this shift, if, if there is a big if, of course, there is one of objective circumstance, other is the subjective manner in which things get implemented. But the fact is, uh, all that we've seen in the US policy towards the region, there will be some downsizing. There will be some rearrangement. And within that, my sense is uh, India should be able to get a larger role, and that will allow the US to concentrate on other tasks. So therefore, ceding India its sphere of influence uh, within the subcontinent, that's one outcome. I mean, I think uh, that probably that's the kind of an outcome that uh, India should be trying for as well. So therefore, the question of uh, how we get there will remain. But I think the idea of, a, of an Indian sphere of influence acknowledged and accepted by the United States uh, could make a difference. In some senses, uh, parts of it you could already see happening in the last decade or more. Uh, you remember in Vajpayee's time, when the Nepal crisis happened, the U.S. said, look, India can take the leadership in the region. We had the first time a regional dialogue. So there were places where, except Pakistan, which was special, where the U.S. was deeply involved after 9-11, uh, the rest of the region, in many times, the U.S. was willing to let India take the leadership. It's not been a consistent policy. It's not been a sustained sustain policy. But the idea that, look, within the smaller countries, the U.S. can let India take the leadership as an idea that's been around. And the question is, can that be transformed today uh, to include Pakistan? We'll come back to that. The second uh, uh, factor that will facilitate an India first policy for the United States in South Asia is the, is the question of Chinese power. Uh, the rise of China has been the subtext uh, in the India-US partnership, uh, explicitly articulated or otherwise. But it was at the kind of 30,000 feet level. Uh, India-US are democracies. Democracies are going to get together. We are promoters of rule of law, blah, blah, blah. And all that, all the, that, that's one level of argument. The second level of argument was uh, on a pivot to Asia that, look, U.S. is going to redo its uh, whole strategy towards Asia and the Indo-Pacific, which you're going to hear more about it, within which India is called the linchpin, or the central element, etc. But all this is fine. It's not at all clear at this point what the next president is going to do on the pivot. But the important thing is this, that the convergence of U.S. and Indian interests in South Asia are growing only stronger, both on the economic side, it was, the, for example, the OBOR. Uh, the U.S. was the first one to talk about a new Silk Road. Uh, when Hillary Clinton, I think, spoke about the new Silk Road, but the Americans don't have money, they said, we'll take you to the guys who have the money. But of course, Chinese come down two years later and say, look, here is the money. We're going to run this project of the grand connectivity, of expansive connectivity projects in, in, in Asia. But I think as the Chinese power radiates into the subcontinent, limiting that to some form uh, necessarily brings India and the U.S. together. The question is how you do it, uh, and uh, the, the, the challenge is we've already seen some extent the U.S. actually 
encouraging India and Japan to work together uh, to counter some of the initiatives that are coming from the Chinese. So therefore, the idea that, that the Chinese power within South Asia, I'm not talking about the whole of Asia, that within Asia, within South Asia, that there can be a practical, direct, straightforward cooperation between India and the US in limiting, balancing the Chinese power in the, in the, in the subcontinent. That brings me to the, the third set of issues, of course, uh, this policy of uh, India, first of course, there are complications while the Americans are worried about the Chinese power. Uh, we've seen them kind of serenading them on the Afghan diplomacy. That, therefore, on the one hand, you say, look, be, be part of us in the pivot in, in East Asia, but we want the Chinese to come and it's, it's partly, I don't know, it's partly a strategic decision or is it the fact you're desperate to have, hand over the tar baby uh, to whoever you can hold it for the next few years. But it doesn't matter. But the fact is that there are ambivalences in the U.S. approach at this point in terms of how exactly to deal with India and China. But I think it opens up space for a fresh discussion on the AFPAC issue, uh, on the uh, South Asia issue in general and Pakistan in particular, because the Pakistan question was the principal reason, Pakistan, the Kashmir question, but the principal reason why India separated from the U.S., and uh, Ambassador Raghavan has written recently about how many times Russia had used the veto. And, and it explains why India drew closer to the Soviet Union. Because of a direct threat to India's national security, which the Anglo-Americans were not willing to acknowledge, and which the Russians are willing to step in, uh, puts India quite clearly uh, in that direction. But the question is, can that policy be changed today? Can the US, as it withdraws uh, from Af Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, will it change that policy? Uh, that is the big question, and I think the here yeah, the two facts we must uh, we must remember. I think one, the general conventional wisdom in Delhi is, of course, U.S. is never going to change. U.S.-Pakistan relationship will never change. Whatever happens in the world, U.S. and Pakistan army uh, are never going to be separated. But then, uh, as the foreign secretary was saying this morning, nothing is permanent. The U.S.-Pakistan relationship is not a Catholic marriage. What God has united, man cannot separate. Uh, that it is not nothing is set in stone. It, so it depends on the context in which things are moving. You already see, to some extent, the fissures that have come, uh, the American refusal to support the Pakistani membership of the NSG, uh, or uh, the recent uh, re issues relating to terrorism. It's not complete, but I think my sense is, if the circumstances continue to change, uh, that the it is possible to explore uh, some fundamental changes in the US approach to Pakistan. Second, I think contrary to Indian narrative, the US is always with Pakistan, but if you look at it empirically, U.S. had intense, episodic interest in Pakistan. There were periods when the U.S. was not interested at all in Pakistan. There were Russians, our dear Russians were doing the mediation, uh, which we so dread about the American mediation. We were sitting in Tashkent. Prime Minister Shastri died there. Uh, so they were Rush Americans were quite happy to cede India and Pakistan to the Russians for a while. Of course, then things 71 happened and all kinds of other things that followed. But the fact is, and then again between 89 to 2001, the U.S. was not the principal player in Afghanistan. So I think we must be clear that there will be circumstances under which the U.S. can pull out of this place. And the question is, that leaves, the big question is, can India, does India have the agency to transform the relation within the subcontinent that will make it easier for the United States or the other powers to cede, to acknowledge, to support uh, Indian primacy in the subcontinent? I think that is the principal question. That, of course, puts the agency entirely on India's shoulders. Uh, how much does India do in taking leadership of the region? What does it do to integrate the region? Uh, can it devise policies to expand its market and give better access to its market, to its neighbors? Uh, can it find ways to pacify Pakistan? Pacify, I'm choosing the word carefully, that you know, it can be through military means, it can be through love, whatever you want to. But the fact is, do you have the capacity to alter the dynamic with Pakistan? That, that India, if India pursues this uh, objectives that are in its self-interest, forget everybody else, you then make it easier for the U.S. and the West to largely cede uh, India's leadership uh, in, the, uh, in the subcontinent. And I think that will be an important element. I think if we look at uh, Modi's foreign policy, the, the centrality of the emphasis on the neighborhood, the core assessment that India, this is India's region, India must lead this region, is probably even more important than the commitment to shed the historic hesitations in engaging the United States, as Modi said, in the U.S. Congress. If that is what is driving, that India needs to restore its historic primacy in the subcontinent, and that there is political will in Delhi to do that today, that I think opens up 
interesting space uh, in which actually the US could contribute in a positive manner. Thank you.